All right, so um, let's get right into it since we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, a lot of this, uh, you've gotten a lot of background about what's going on in healthcare in general, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the federal space with respect to the secure interoperable exchange of health information. Um, President Obama, who um, is the current administration, obviously, has issued some several statements with respect to health IT and the use of computerized technology and electronic health records. And so this is just one of several um, where he's iterating the vision for this administration that we have this call to action to use health IT. Um, this is not the first administration who's made this call. Uh, the Bush administration issued executive orders. Clinton administration prior to that also had uh, uh, objectives of being able to create electronic health records for all Americans. So let's talk a little bit about the state of affairs. Uh, what's driving all of this? Um, currently, we're spending a, a about $2.2, $2.3 trillion a year. I haven't seen the statistics for the latest year that they've reported on for health care um, in, in this country, uh, over $7,000 per person, and it comes to about 16% of the GDP. Um, and this is uh, significant when we compare it to other countries that are out there. And when you look at the value that we're getting for health care at this cost, it doesn't stack up to what other countries are getting for what they're spending on health care. So number one is we're spending a lot of money on it, and people are questioning the value of that investment. Are we really getting what we're, what we're paying for? The second item is that um, when you look at the adoption of technology, and Fred quoted statistics and, and Deb quoted statistics on it, um, it's just miserable, the penetration of the use of electronic health record technology, whether it's in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting, depending on how you define it. St uh, statistics range anywhere from 8% to 17, 20, I think I've seen as high as 28 or 29 percent, depending on what their criteria was uh, in terms of adoption of the technologies. And it's not that medicine is technology averse. I mean, we spend a lot of money on scanners and equipment and tools in the OR and ICU, a lot of fancy doodads for rendering care. So it's not that the providers are you know, technophobic. Um, it's just that they don't see value for the amount of pain that they have to go through for entering data into an electronic health record system. We don't have the user interface right at this point. And then the third item here that's kind of uh, driving all this is the lack of interoperable EHRs. Um, if you've seen one, you've seen one. And even in, with Vista, if you see one, you've seen one <laughs> as you go across the VA system. Um, so um, there's a lack of inter general interoperability in terms of being able to share records back and forth. So we have this national health IT agenda. And we've had it for a while. We had it uh, established in the last administration. We updated it in this administration with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, we've, we're investing $19 billion in computerized medical records um, in the form of grants. Uh, if you've been following what we've been doing at HHS over the last uh, 15 months, um, we've given out a lot of money um, in, in big dollops, uh, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in SHARP grants and a state HIE grants, and, and we've even created a system of uh, extension centers for health IT. Um, now, that's significant because the government funds only two other kinds of extension centers in this country, the agricultural extension centers and manufacturing extension centers. And so now we've added a third class of extension centers that we've provided funding for, and that's for health IT. That's how important it is in this administration. Now, the idea is that if we can you know, promote this agenda of sharing health information and doing it in a way that's meaningful, we can increase the access to care, decrease the, the cost of care, improve quality, promote the meaningful use of EHRs, all of these things are kind of related, and this is a part of the overall agenda that the President set for us in terms of open and transparent government. So let me talk briefly about the federal health architecture. It is a component organization that is managed under the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. It's part of HHS. FHA got its start as an OMB eGov initiative uh, during the Bush administration under an executive order. And um, so it was uh, actually preceded the creation of ONC. And once uh, the Office of the National Coordinator was created, it was put under ONC because it made sense. It was about federal health architecture. All these different agencies that touch uh, health data, either create it or consume it, would be working together to solve common problems and to do shared investment. What OMB wanted to accomplish was optimizing investment across multiple agencies um, so that they could get the biggest bang for the buck. Historically, 
agencies are budgeted for the agency. They don't look at cross-agency projects. So it's all about optimizing the investment within a given vertical stack, if you will, of, of the federal government. And what OMB wanted to do with the establishment of FHA was to look across these agencies, find common problems that they could work on together, and do an investment strategy that optimized investment across all of those agencies. Um, so that was a big deal. That was uh, moving in a new direction, new territory. Um, once ONC was put into place, we were stuck under them, not in a bad way. We were just put over there because we needed some agency to manage uh, our office. Um, but we also still maintain reporting to OMB, so we have two bosses, OMB and ONC. So these are all the federal agencies that are involved with FHA. These are all their little shields and medallions and logos, what have you. Um, and you can see there's quite a few. There's 16 departments represented here. The Department of Health and Human Services has 10 divisions, operating divisions, and so there's 26 agencies that either touch, uh, create, consume health information or health-related information. So that's a pretty significant number of agencies that are out there. So the Connect project um, got its start. Um, I think most of you have heard, well, maybe you haven't. Uh, we've got this little project that we call the Nationwide Health Information Network, or the NHIN, or NIN, or NHIN. All of those are approved. We didn't standardize the pronunciation of the acronym, um, and we don't hope to be able to do that, despite many efforts to have an official uh, pronunciation of it. Um, we had a set of prototype contracts that were let in the 2006 timeframe, um, where we explored architectures for creating a health internet, if you will. Um, could it be centralized, decentralized? You know, how, what would work in terms of being able to have these nodes talking to one another and exchanging health information? That was followed on by a set of contracts in 2007 called the NIN Trial Implementations uh, Contracts. And while the first one was a set of contracts that were awarded to four big system integrators to explore architecture, the second set of contracts, the trial implementations, were awarded to operational health information exchanges. So we were looking at, at organizations that were up and running or about to be up and running, exchanging health data. And we wanted to bring those together to be able to define a set of service interface specifications for exchanging health information and also to define content, standard content, that we would be sending back and forth for those exchanges. So we established um, this set of contracts. There were nine originally awarded in, uh, at the end of 2007. It included organizations like uh, Reagan Street, or the Indiana Health Information Network, uh, Delaware Health Information Network. There were um, nine total organizations uh, across the country. Uh, and then there were five additional grants made about six months later to add, uh, or I'm sorry, six additional grants to bring the total to 15. So we had 15 different organizations that were involved. The original nine had the task of forming a cooperative whereby they would work together to define the service interspaces, interfaces to define content and to um, work on things like data use and reciprocal sharing agreements because one of the things that was really hard was to come up with the data sharing agreements that organizations could agree to and sign and then exchange information. That was one of the things that seemed to be an HIE killer, if you will, out there when you look across the experience. Um, the other thing that kills HIEs is sustainable business models um, and folks are still working on how to, how to make that work. But uh, fundamentally, uh, we were able to bring these folks together, that original nine, worked on defining specs, the, the next six were brought in, um, and their job was simply to implement the specs, and, and federal agencies were not involved with this at the beginning, so they were a little bit concerned about that, because they knew they would have to implement those specifications, but they didn't have a say in how they were being developed. So we put together a strategy in 2007 that said, this is how the feds want to connect to the NHIN. They, Basically, it's four prongs. We'll form a federal health IT consortium. That consortium will participate in the NIN trial implementations, just like all the other awardees. You know, we'll sign up to do all the same deliverables and participate all in, in all the same work groups, which meant we would have to do an implementation of those service specs and also test and demonstrate that implementation. And then the last prong of the strategy was we didn't want to just go play in the sandbox and implement a test environment, we wanted to go into production. The agencies felt that if they're going to spend the money to do it, they wanted to go into production and do live health information exchange. So the Project Connect was, was born as a project out of that. 
Um, the agencies decided on October 12th, 2007, that they wanted to execute that four-pronged strategy. And so the next week, one week later, we became a part of the NIN cooperative of the trial implementations and began to participate in that. So um, basically, Connect, as, as I've been explaining, is, is one on one side, it's this, uh, this initiative that's a multi-agency collaboration where the agencies decided to pool their funds, their pennies, and, and decide to invest in building this software implementation. And um, then they would basically deploy, deploy it into their individual operational environments and uh, bring it into production activities. When we set the project up, there was an interesting requirement uh, that was laid on us at a management level that said, we want to make this an open source project. Now, part of that comes out of the VA's experience with Vista and, and Fred. If he were here, he could tell you how difficult it's been to get copies of Vista code. You know, he has to go through the FOIA process. And, and there are, you know, that's not a bad process. It just takes time. And so VA folks were very intent on saying, we want to make this available to the public. Let's figure out how to do that. So when we let the contract for development, we specified that it would all be done as open source software using a new BSD license and that we would release it to the public under that licensing agreement. So Connect is a, is a federally funded open source software project that is, uh, we look at as a platform for participation in health information exchange and also as a platform for innovation. I get asked everywhere I go, what's the difference between Connect and the NIN Exchange? The NIN Exchange is actually the production environment where we have multiple organizations that are utilizing NIN service specifications and content standards to exchange real patient data with their partners that are a part of that exchange. In order to be a part of that exchange, you have to go through an onboarding process. You have to sign the data use and reciprocal sharing or support agreement, which is like the treaty, if you will, that all the nations sign to be able to participate in the exchange. And this has to do with building the legal trust fabric for organizations to share data that's definitely PII data, personally identifiable information. Um, and then once you onboard, there's a PKI certificate that allows for servers to talk to one another and mutually validate uh, one another and establish technical trust. So that, that NIN exchange is that kind of operational production exchange that's in uh, use today. And then Connect is this software project that actually implements the NIN service specifications and content standards. So as I said, um, it, from the very beginning, the federal partners pushed really hard for us to be an open source project. So we have released the software in April of 2009. We made that available uh, to the public uh, under the BSD license. Um, we made that announcement at HIMSS. And we also announced that we would begin to build an open source community. Um, we brought Brian in as a consultant uh, to help us with formulating strategies around that. We had our first training seminar in June of 2009, where we had approximately 1,200 people show up for that training event. A bit of a surprise, because we figured we'd, if we had a couple hundred sign up and you know 150 or 200 show up, we'd be doing well. Um, so out of 1,400 that signed up, a little over 1,200 actually showed up. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, as far as community events, we have uh, training seminars we try to do every year, a major training seminar event. We do webinar, webinars every quarter, um, and we do uh, try to do codathons, hackathons, um, at quarterly, although I think we're kind of around three a year right now, um, not quite getting the fourth quarter in there um, every time consistently. But um, so far, we've had codathons, one here in Oregon um, last fall. Um, we had uh, one in Miami, Florida. Uh, the next one's scheduled at um, the Mayo Clinic um, in Rochester this fall in September. Um, and so it's part of our ongoing outreach in terms of the community. And at each of those, um, so far we've announced additional uh, committers, new committers that are outside of the project that are part of the open source community, earning their stripes, if you will, to become committers to the code base. Um, and so we, we have a fair amount of uh, participation there. So let's talk about implementation strategy. In February of 2009, the Social Security Administration was the first federal agency to go into live production using NIN standards. Um, we just finished the trial implementations in December of 2008. Um, two months later, they went live with a civilian partner or uh, private sector partner, MedVA. And so they have been in production since that time, exchanging data. Uh, 
And you would ask, why would Social Security Administration be interested in medical records? Um, they are one of the largest consumers of medical records in the world uh, because anybody who applies for benefits makes a claim about some medical disability and they need evidence for that. So they spend over a half a billion dollars a year paying for medical records to be able to determine whether somebody has a disability or not. Um, and on average, it takes three requests before they actually get the records from the doctor's office and it takes anywhere from three to nine months to make a determination. In the context of this health information exchange, we've been able to take that time from th three to nine months to make a determination down to as short as uh, two weeks. Uh, requests that took months to get records back now take minutes, um, less than three minutes in some cases. Um, and if it, with their automated mega hit application, which is their mega health IT application, which um, automates the analysis of data to determine disabilities, if it's one of the diseases that's in that system, then they can make a determination in about a week um, and turn that around, which is significant for folks who are applying for benefits. So this year, SSA is expanding from one organization to 15 additional organizations that they want to have uh, exchanges with, and they'll be doing that over the next 18 months. In January, the Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, and Kaiser Permanente went into live production in San Diego for the exchange of health information using the NIN standards. Um, it's called the VLOR Project, Virtual Lifetime Electronic Record, if you haven't heard of that. Um, that's another acronym. We're full of acronyms. And so they're going to do the next update to that environment at the end of this month, just in another week uh, or so. And they will begin to bring on additional regions in the country. So the next region is in Hamptons uh, Road, Virginia. Um, and they'll be bringing on MedVA as a part of that uh, triumvirate. We'll expand to have four members. and. The goal is for the Department of Defense and VA to kind of work out the operational kinks of doing health information exchange in this environment on the NIN exchange. And then once they're comfortable from an operational uh, perspective, then they would expand so that they were nationwide and would have full availability. There's a backlog of over 200 organizations that are queued up that want to exchange information with the VA. And so once they're ready to do that, then we'll rapidly expand that to those 200 organizations. Um, and we'll only be, the rate limiting step will be the ability to get people um, up and running on a, on a Connect instance, or if they're implementing their own instance of the uh, specs, is getting it implemented and then testing it for interoperability and conformance. So they're moving along. We've added the um, CDC, which is uh, doing exchanges with three states right now state public health departments. We've added CMS in June, the Care C hype project. PQRI, which is Physician Quality uh, Reporting Initiative, will be added in the fall. And then ESMD, which is Medical Submission of Documentation, which is a part of their fraud monitoring program, will be added at the end of the year. Um, we've also added some Medicaid uh, transactions, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, the, the National Disaster Medical System is the another agency that, that's using it, and IHS, the Indian Health Service, is bringing up their federal clinics this month and next into operations on it. So we'll have gone from one agency to seven agencies um, by the end of this year uh, in terms of federal agencies on the exchange with the addition of of additional private sector entities that are exchanging with those federal partners. So this is all federal activity. When we look at non-feds that are involved with um, uh, doing test demos or moving into production with uh, the Connect software and, and NIN standards and, and protocols, um, all of these folks um, on this slide uh, are either in some form of test demo or moving into production, and those are the estimated timelines for when they plan to do that. We find that we kind of discover on a monthly basis new organizations that have downloaded the software and are doing interesting things with it. So, um, you know, we, it's kind of open-ended. We, we really don't know for sure what the degree of penetration is. Uh, we, as we discover new instances, we get their stories and we put them on the, on the website so folks can learn from that. But it's a fairly uh, significant rate of increase. The other thing that we do is we're working to build an ecosystem of companies that provide services and products around the Connect platform. And so these are some of the companies that have uh, currently either have um, service offerings or product offerings related to the platform itself. They're also on the website. So let's talk a little bit about technology since it's a geek conference. Um, 
Um, I made a comment to somebody before we started, I'm the scariest person here because I'm the suit, and I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. So when people tell you that, you should run screaming from the room. But at any rate, um, so um, let's take the suit off for a second here and just talk about some of the technologies. We, I mentioned that we worked in the 2008 to define a set of service interface specifications for exchanging health information in a secure, interoperable fashion. This was no small undertaking, and as Arian will tell you in his presentation where he's working on the NINDIRECT project, it's worse than herding cats. <laughs> There's a lot of work to build consensus and get folks to come to an agreement uh, when it comes to technical things because there are a lot of opinions, strong opinions, about what's right and what's wrong, what works and what doesn't. So out of that year of effort, we were able to define a stack of services that we use for exchanging health information. So if you'll ignore the bottom layer, that's operational infrastructure. I'll come back to it a minute. Uh, in a minute. The Messaging Security and Privacy Foundation, there are three specifications that we've written there. There's one called the Messaging Platform, the Authorization Framework, and then there's the Access Control Policy. These three together combined basically build out that Messaging and Security Privacy Foundation that allows us to be able to connect, uh, uh, verify in terms of authentication and authorization, um, between servers um, and to set up the conditions whereby we can exchange information, you can make requests, you can make assertions about who's making those requests, um, and the access control policy allows us to express in computable form uh, in Zachamal statements the policies about the release of information. On top of this foundation, we have a set of discovery and information exchange services. Um, we can do patient discovery, and we can discover, discover what other organizations and services that they offer um, out there through the UDDI service registry. In terms of information exchange, we implement three messaging patterns, pull, push, and pub, sub, which are basic messaging patterns. I mean, this is not rocket science. It's SMOP, right? Simple matter of programming. Um, and so the pull paradigm is your classic query and retrieve for documentation. So you, you, let's say you have a workflow where you discovered that a patient has data over in another HIE. Now you can request for documents and get a list of those and then retrieve what you need out of that list. Um, we added eligibility verification, which is your X12-270-71 transactions that we demonstrated at HIMSS this past year, and we're adding um, claim submission and pri uh, prior authorization by the end of December um, if we um, continue with the work plan that we have with Medicaid right now. The push service is a new one. This is document submission. It's based on the um, uh, XDR spec from IHE. Um, and so this was designed so that if multiple organizations needed to push documents into a central organization, that organization wouldn't have to go out and subscribe to thousands of organizations. Organizations just could just push uh, unsolicited to that organization. PubSub is obviously one where you would want to subscribe to a stream of data, and we call that health information exchange, uh, or, yeah, HIEM. Um, and so. On top of these services, we have a set of transaction profiles which define the content of the exchange and any particulars about the exchange itself. So, for example, Gypsy is um, a specification for geo-encoded um, counts data for epidemiological purposes, and it uses HIEM. So it specifies, send me the data every 24 hours unless the file size gets to 10 megabytes and make it reliable delivery. So it, it you know, deliver one time and one time only. Um, so you can set up that specification uh, in the HIEM for that kind of uh, transaction. So on top, or at a foundational level, from an operational perspective, there are two two components that we have uh, that we manage at ONC. One is the PKI infrastructure. We have a root certificate authority that we issue um, certificates for the PKI for mutual authentication, TLS authentication between servers. Um, and then we have the UDDI Web Services Registry. So as you go through onboarding and you're approved for um, onboarding, you've signed your DURSA, you get your PKI certificate, and you get your uh, entry into the registry, and then everybody else can begin to discover you. In terms of, um, I guess, if you were at a technical conference and you didn't talk about the stack, you would be amiss. So um, this is the current development stack that we have. Um, this was the release that just came out in June. Um, so this was kind of the versions of all the things that we're using. But fundamentally in this project, when I set the contract up, I directed the use of open source software from the beginning. We Every tool that we use, um, to the degree that we could find open source tools that were robust enough to be able to be used in the project, we've always selected an open source tool um, when it was available um, as our first choice. 
Now, we have versions of Connect that run on uh, Solaris and Linux, um, and as far as other app servers, we um, run on JBoss, and that's tested on a, day, on a daily basis. We have continuous integration, continuous test and build. Um, and uh, we recently had one of our partners announce that they had ported it to uh, WebLogic and that we, uh, another one has it running on WebSphere. Um, I haven't seen the WebLogic implementation yet, but I have seen the WebSphere implementation up and running. So um, once we verify the WebLogic implementation, then we'll make announcements um, and availability of that on the web. Um, it wouldn't be... I get called chief architect sometimes, and so if you're doing an architecture discussion, it's not an architecture discussion without a cloud diagram of some sort. Um, so this is the requisite cloud diagram, um, and it's also the software stack at a detailed level of the gateway itself. Connect has three component layers. There's a, a gateway layer, which is basically the outward-facing piece that implements the services that have been specified for the NHIN. And so this is really the interoperability piece. Um, the next layer down is the adapter layer, which allows you to plug in your edge system, whether it's an EHR, practice management system, lab system, whatever it is that needs to be able to communicate across the NHIN. Um, we have adapter capabilities where you can plug into that and participate in exchange. And then the third layer is what we call the universal client layer, which allows folks to develop applications against the enterprise service components that are in the adapter layer. Um, but this basically shows a message that's coming in from the NHIN. There's a set of orchestrations that take place um, in the gateway, and then it gets passed off to um, the adapter in terms of uh, then off uh, on down to the um, end system or the edge system. This is the opposite direction. Messages flowing back out across the NHIN. In terms of um, the adapter, the things that we currently package with that, we have a master patient index, and all these components are open source components that we've pulled out of the community, out of other projects we package with um, Connect as options that you can use in your operational environment. Now, when we set that up, some of the federal agencies already have enterprise licenses for commercial products. Um, VA, for example, uses Initiate as their MPI, so they said, hey, we don't want that open source thing. We want to be able to plug our Initiate in there. So we got with Initiate and worked with them to be able to plug into the architecture. So the adapter framework is really um, the work we've been doing there is specifying a set of APIs, trying to standardize those APIs for plugging these components into that component framework where you can then plug and play whatever it is, whether it's an open source component or um, a, um, a proprietary component. Um, and we're pretty promiscuous in partnering with people, if you will. Anybody who expresses an interest, we're, well, sure, come on over to the party. We'll figure out how we can put you into this mix. Um, so we don't have a um, strong bias against anybody that wants to come play at the table. So we've packaged the master patient index. There's actually a couple of choices there. Mirth has their Mirth match. Um, there's the Sun Mural product, which is open source. You can also buy their licensed version of that. Um, we have a couple of policy engines. There's the Open SSO, and then there's a product called, from a little company called Jericho that makes a policy engine, which basically is your policy decision point, uh, and that's what processes SACML and SAML assertions. We recently added a redaction engine. This is an open source component that we built. Um, at this point in Connect, you have the, op the ability to opt in and opt out at a general level for sharing information. If you opt in, you can opt in with exceptions. Um, and we are also able to restrict by document class type. So we took the XDS meta model for uh, the data types or the document types in an XDS repository. And we've now implemented in the, uh, the logic in the redaction engine that says, okay, if the policy says I want to share everything except mental health records, and mental health records is one of the metadata types of documents that are available in XDS registry, when you go to query, um, the policy engine will pass off to the redaction engine that says, hey, we don't want to show that you have mental health records and we don't want to return any of those, so those get redacted out of the set before they get responded back across the NHIN. Um, to the person who's making the query. Audit services are obviously important because we have to meet HIPAA accounting requirements. Um, we have a document registry and repository component that's uh, XDSB compliant. Um, subscriptions uh, repository, which manages uh, your HIEM subscriptions. There's a re-identification service, so if you've pseudonymized a data set, you have the ability under the certain circumstances with the right authorizations to request re-identification, and this is a service that allows that to occur. 
um, entity integration services. This is basically a, a set of basic services that we've added in to allow for integration of additional components, and then the SDK services, which are, we have a set of uh, specified web interfaces for plugging in. If you've got a system that's got web interfaces, we can wrap those and plug them in pretty quickly. So, 3L was released in June. Uh, we release every quarter. Um, so we have a quarterly release cycle. We do two-week sprints. I use Scrum to manage an agile software development process that's test-driven, continuous integration, continuous build. Um, I probably have as the largest collection of software metrics on any healthcare project um, in the world right now. So if you're interested in learning about the project management data about software quality, all of those kinds of things, uh, come see me and I'd be happy to talk to you about that uh, because we, we've incorporated an, an enormous number of tools into monitoring this. I can tell you per function point cost, I can tell you where every dollar has been spent in the project. We publish those reports um, to Congress or whoever asks, asks for them and they, they ask on a regular basis, how are you spending the money? Um, and so, um, you know, there's nothing classified here. We'd be happy to share any of that with you if you're interested in it. 3.1 will come out in September. Um, and with the next release, um, we're working on a major refactoring of the Connect Core where we're going to make it an embeddable Java library. Um, and um, so this will actually help us complete platform independence uh, with respect to app servers, uh, OSs, and um, with the uh, respect to IDEs as well because we now are doing development in both uh, NetBeans and uh, Eclipse. And so there's a bunch of things that we're doing internal to this refactoring, which will help us improve performance, help us to increase portability. Um, it will also lay in the foundation so that if we want to do RESTful APIs or other protocols in the future, we can do that. And it also reduces uh, some of the performance demands in the stack right now. We've discovered a set of use cases in document retrieve and query services that are what we call deferred. They're long-running transactions that may take a day or a week or a month because a human has to be in the loop to make a decision about the release of information or to evaluate a particular report and say whether it's uh, complete or not. And so, you know, we have synchronous and asynchronous transactions, and in this instance, you have to have the ability to fire this thing off, but you don't want to keep ports open, you don't want to keep threads blocked until this thing comes back if it's going to be a month. And so we've got this paradigm that we work through for these deferred uh, types of long-running queries. And so we've implemented it for document submission. This round, we're implementing it for doc query and doc retrieve um, services. We have a requirement for moving large files, images and uh, data files. And so um, we are uh, currently enhancing that ability to be able to move multi-gigabyte files around the network. Um, and then we also had a file for just 100 megabyte uh, text files uh, being able to do that. How are we doing on time? Uh, okay, we're, we're close to the question period here in just a second. Um, so the, the additional, uh, we're adding a new administrative distribution service. This is support uh, PQRI. This is based on the HISP T63, which is um, OASIS EDXL standard um, for broadcasting messages out. Uh, their original intent was in the uh, kind of the administrative kinds of transactions in an emergency environment, and we've extended that to be able to use it for general administrative distribution as a part of a NIN service. And so this is an emerging service, uh, uh, what we call a, uh, uh, it's kind of in a test phase right now. And so once we get the implementation done and test data back on this from uh, CMS at the end of the year, then it'll be promoted into the production standards uh, in the next round, probably in the spring. Uh, we have a requirement for some organizations want every interface inside the organization secure because they're running part thing, some things in the cloud, some things locally. So everything has to be encrypted and use SAML assertions between all of the components. Other organizations have everything inside the castle moat and so they don't care whether there are secured interfaces inside or not. So we have to support both of those. Performance, um, if, if you've ever worked with federal agencies, when they go into production, their value system changes from focusing on functionality to function or to performance. Everything's about performance and scalability and graceful degradation. Um, and so um, now that we've got the number of agencies that we have into production, we're still adding features and functions, obviously, but the big focus now is 
how many threads can I open in this one socket, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've got 8,000 messages coming in this second. You know, are you going to be able to support this? And, oh, by the way, there are 100 megabyte files attached to each one of those. Um, what's this going to do to my gateway? And how, how big is the iron I need to buy to be able to support that? So we've got a whole, uh, actually a, a dedicated work group that's focused on performance engineering for Connect now. And so out of that, they have a set of requirements, a set of tests, and we're instrumenting code, adding performance testing in as a part of our testing pipeline. So what you do, check in a piece of code, it goes through 1,500 unit tests, then it goes through um, conformance testing, interoperability testing, performance, you know, all these different things that we have to put it through as a part of that testing pipeline. And then, of course, they want that automated and be able to spit those results out to the web. So that's part of what we're working on. As far as future beyond 3.1, which would be released in September, for 3.2, which would be at the end of December, beginning of January, um, so these are some of the things that we're working on. Now, Arian's working with the NINDirect project, and they have uh, looks like they've uh, settled on SMTP as a backbone protocol. So that introduces an additional backbone protocol to the NHIN. So one of the things that we're looking at is the idea for pluggable protocols and dynamic protocol negotiation between gateways to be able to support this. Uh, I don't know what that means yet. Uh, we have some ideas about it. Um, and it's an interesting problem to work on, and we're actually kind of excited about working on it. Um, and so once we get that in place, then it won't really matter if we want to add new protocols to the backbone we can. We'll be able to support it. Um, and so we're, we're kind of looking forward to figuring that out, you know, from a comp side perspective. Um, obviously, our federal partners are monitoring very closely the NINDIRECT project, and so they expect us to implement support for that in the gateway um, by the end of the calendar year. And so we're basically waiting for Arian's group to finish the specs. Um, and once those are done, then we'll do the implementation and connect for those things, and there'll be a, a, a connect implementation of the direct uh, specifications. We have an emerging set of requirements for resource management and logistics services. The NHIN is bigger than clinical data. It includes all the data that the healthcare value chain needs to operate. And part of what we're, my vision for this is that we really will have a healthcare value chain or a healthcare service chain um, in place that will really have a healthcare system. Right now, it's so fragmented and broken up that you just, it's, you know, we struggle with just basic things, getting basic data across. Transactions where you take this four before off the shelf and it reports back through the logistics system to order it, a replacement for it, or this drug, you get your ordered replacement or what have you. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking to streamline over the long haul. So right now, I have a group that's come to me about uh, resource management and list logistics requirements, and so I have a meeting in a week, a week from Friday with that group to begin to iron out what are the, the emerging services that we'll need to implement to support that. Obviously, with the passage of the, or the release of the final rule for meaningful use, um, the focus on ONC uh, is, first of all, how do you read that 800-page document and digest it into something meaningful that programmers uh, are interested in? Um, that's our first task, but once we get that done, we'll be, there will be an emerging set of services to support that that we'll be implementing. Identity management is an important piece. Um, the White House put out a strategy document with respect to uh, identity management in cyberspace, and so we've got some things that we'll be addressing towards that, and semantic services, which is semantic interoperability is one of the fun things for me to work on, so I'm excited about that. And then one of my favorite things is uh, pragmatics, computational pragmatics, which is really focused on context. And that's where things like context-based, uh, context-aware clinical decision support become important. So um, if you're interested in having some um, dialogue on that, see me um, on the break, and I can bring you up to speed with some things that we're thinking about there. Upcoming events. We've always got things in the hopper for Connect. Um, I've been on this speaking circuit now for a while. Last week I was out at the SOAN Healthcare Conference, and these are some of the upcoming conferences that I've got. There, there's a military open source conference in, in August in D.C. Um, we've got the Enterprise Architecture Conference also in D.C. in September. Um, then we have the September Codathon. We have webinars that will happen in early October after the release of the September uh, software that we released 3.1. Um, and then I've got speaking engagements, I think, in De uh, Denver um, in October, November time frame, and then there's some other things that are out there for a little, little, little bit beyond that. Um, this is our portal. For anything and all things related to Connect, just go to connectopensource.org. Um, there are developer resources, user resources. There are forums available here. 
Um, if you have questions, this is where you need to go to find the answers. Um, if you can't get the answers, then email me, david.riley at hhs.gov, and I'd be happy to uh, connect you to the right people to get you the answers. So with that, let me just pause for a breath. And Brian says we have five minutes for questions, so if you have questions, um, we can surely probably answer those. Yes? The, the question is, is what are the demographics of the community contributors? Um, were you asking whether these are medical people or just? Or, or, yeah, I'm asking what they are. Okay. Um, the, the ones, obviously, that we've awarded uh, committer privileges to the source tree are coders. Um, and uh, so those have come from companies like Red Hat Linux, for example, um, and ob I think it was object computing. And um, there's a couple of different uh, folks that have been awarded. Um, some of the Mirth guys, I think, got their commit privileges the last codeathon. Um, and so most of these are, are healthcare technology vendors, um, or they're in the open source space like Linux. Wanted, the Red Hat folks wanted to make sure that Connect ran on JBoss and Linux, and so they actually worked to get the port up and running and helped get the continuous integration server set up. So we do the continuous integration and testing suite uh, against those products. Um, as far as uh, right now, I don't have any. I don't have any doctors committing code, but you know, most of the time they're they're not really that. Um, deep developers you know they they have good ideas i have a whole community of, of medical practitioners i come out of the medical pra practice i practice primary care medicine in the air force and prior to that i was a critical care nurse and trauma nurse and um, so my background is clinical and i love spending time with clinical folks um, to to get the requirements down for what we need to do but right now i don't have for the most part i don't have a community of doctors or nurses that are actually building software they're they're contributing to, to requirements okay yes The question is, how are we going to ensure that uh, we have computability for EMR records and how are we going to handle that in, in the future? Um, there are a number of things that we're doing. Um, at the adapter layer, we have um, uh, done an experimental branch with the Department of Defense uh, that is really where we're doing a lot of the semantic interoperability work. Um, so we've taken the HITSP C83 model, which is based on the, the CCD, uh, this may be foreign <laughs> language to you, HL7 has a standard, a document standard for um, clinical documents, it's called the Clinical Document Architecture. Um, we've taken that and um, in, the, in the HITSP, which was the Health Information Technology Standards Panel, which did all the standards harmonization, um, they basically, their C83 construct uh, is bringing CCD concepts into HITSP speak. And so it's there where all those, I don't know, it's about 1,800 um, data items from the HL7 information model, the REM uh, 3.0, uh, are instantiated in, in HITSP land, if you will. And so we've done an implementation of that, and we've got a common abstraction layer that allows us to plug in an, e an EMR. If it has structured data, we're able to pull that in. There's some conversion steps that we can go through if we need to make conversions, but there's a canonical model that we can pull it into. Then we have a, a document template manager and a document manager, so the template manager passes off. So whatever document we need to produce in, in terms of HITSP standards, C, uh, C32, C37, whatever it is, um, we have the ability to be able to generate, uh, to populate those documents. And then if uh, it works in conjunction with the redaction manager, so in the future we'll be moving down into the sections of the document where you can restrict by section. So I don't want my problem list to go out. Um, so you'll be able to set a policy um, and the VA is working with us to create a user interface for capturing patient consent and restrictions like this so that when, it, when the patient completes it, it'll generate Zacamole that can then be imported into the policy engine and, and enforced in the runtime environment. Uh, but as far as semantic interoperability, um, you know, we're looking at uh, adding terminology servers or ontology servers, and, and my team has a lot of experience in um, building ontologies, large scale ontologies, SNOMED. I, uh, international size terminologies and ontologies um, and, and being able to get performance out of those. So it's a matter of, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the various open source implementations that are available for terminology services that are CTS2 compliant, uh, which is an OMG standard for terminologies. 
uh, and ontology servers. So we want to bring that um, into the picture. And, and I suspect, given the, the way we're proceeding on requirements, it'll either be in the 3.2 time frame or probably 3.3 before we'll actually see uh, implementations that are fully supportive of that. DOD will be pulling their code into the core baseline over the next two uh, quarters. Uh, and then once that's done, it'll be available as a set of adapter level services that folks can take advantage of. But we are fully cognizant of that requirement. Our goal is to have fully computed, computable structured data because uh, that has the highest value to us for healthcare transformation. Yes? Well, it's funny that you bring that up <laughs> because one of the jewels out there is a little community hospital in Thayer, Nebraska that we, they called us and said, hey, did you know we're doing this with your software? And like, no, what are you doing? Um, they downloaded it, in, implemented it. They got with the Mirth guys and did some integration with their interface engine. And so they have their own little health information exchange that they set up in that region of Nebraska. They're transferring medical records and lab data and pharmacy data and all kinds of stuff. And so we thought that that group would, you know, those kinds of groups would be the least likely to do it. But they were one of the very early adopters um, once we released it out to the, to the general public. And so they demonstrated with us at HEMS this year, basically. So it Yeah, one of the things that Mirth brings to the table is they have all these channel adapters for existing EHR technology. And so they did a recent survey at my request to see how many commercially available EHRs they actually have adapters for and whether or not, if, if they didn't develop them, whether or not the people who did would put them in the open source. So we're actually um, pulling that list together, working with John and Gary Tycro to um, put together the list of channel adapters that are available for commercial EHRs, which would mean the integration with those existing EHRs would go much faster with the Connect, since Mirth has already integrated Connect into their platform and, and have made it available as a part of their appliance, hardware appliance. I think we're all out of time, but do you want, okay, so we should um, get, uh, get Arian up here because he's got the next chapter of the story that we're working on.